Good morning, St. Michael's, on this beautiful spring day. It's wonderful to be with you, making this worship space here together. If you're coming to us for the very first time, we're so glad you have found us, and we will look for ways um, to connect with you later on. If you stick with us through this service, you'll find out some information later that will tell you how to get more connected into our community here. Today's service continues the uh, commemoration of Lent, the, the observance of Lent, that's the word I'm looking for, as we continue to prepare for the good news of Jesus' resurrection at Easter. Today's service, the third Sunday in Lent, also has the bittersweet distinction of being exactly one church year since we were here together in person in the church. And it has been quite a year, but as always, the resurrection is coming and we continue to celebrate that good news. We'll celebrate a Eucharist today, so if you'd like to participate symbolically, we invite you to get yourself a piece of bread or something like that to use um, as a way of sharing together collectively when we come around the table. And now come and let us settle our hearts and minds and be together in this space and let us worship. Blessed be the God of our salvation. Jesus said, the first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Let us confess our sins to God. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. May God be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Hello, St.
St. Michael's, and welcome. My name is Bruce W. Frazier. Today's reading from the Hebrew Bible comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I the Lord your God am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the fourth, to the, pardon, to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation to those who love and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son, or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
St. Michael's. My name is John Stickney. Today's epistle reading comes from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who were the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said that this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. So, how are you doing? I mean, really, how are you doing? I can't hear you. Oh, you can't answer, right. So, let's pretend you asked me that question. Well, I'm doing okay. You know, this has been a long year, but our kids are so lucky to be in person at school, and my mom got the vaccine, and I've been amazed at how resilient this congregation of St. Michael's has been. You know, so overall, I'm doing okay. Well, that's great, you respond, but you just told me about a bunch of other people. How are you doing? Okay, well, let me think. Uh, I'm okay, I guess. Um, you know, I had my favorite muesli for breakfast this morning, and I went for a great run this week. I'm reading some good books. We're really enjoying Ted Lasso. Have you seen it? Oh, and I'm getting the vaccine too. But, you know, my knee's a little sore and I've got this kind of itchy spot that I just can't kind of make go away. And oh, Thursday night I was feeling a little bummed. I don't know why. And, you know, I'm really behind on my to-do list. And wait, are you still listening? Hello? In the dominant culture around us, we more often think of that question, how are you doing, as being, well, all about me, you right? Wellness, which has become something like a $52 billion industry in this country, is understood to be about how an individual person is, physically, psychologically, emotionally, maybe spiritually. But that's a little different in other cultures. How I am is tied up with how we are. Our health and well-being depends upon our community's health and well-being. I'm okay if you're okay. I'm less okay if you're not. And we might live in this dominant culture of me, but this other kind of culture is usually part of our lives as well. Church can be one of those cultures. Certain families can be, certain ethnic groups. All of those can be places where I am tied up with we, which can sometimes hit up against that dominant individualism in a complicated way. Am I solely responsible for me? Or am I also responsible for you and you responsible for me? It's one of our dividing line questions in this country, politically speaking, but it's also often divided within each one of us, especially when we bring God into the equation. The lesson that we heard today 
from Hebrew scripture, the Ten Commandments, shows us one of those tension points between I and we. Although this is a covenant between God and all of God's people as a community, the commandments in the original language are addressed to the singular individual. Each one of us is supposed to be living this way in order for all of us as a community to be in relationship with one another and with God. How I live affects you. How you live affects me. But we've more often turned those commandments into personal rules, to follow or not, and God into a scorekeeper that marks it down, whichever one of those we choose. I think perhaps we're missing the boat. Throughout this whole season of Lent, our Hebrew scriptures deal with the questions of covenant, from Noah to Abraham to Moses and on from there. Covenant, as has been said many times in many sermons, is the biblical word for a relationship. The relationship of mutual support and accountability that exists between people and between people and God. The first two Sundays of Lent gave us God's side of that relationship. First with the promise made to Noah after the flood, where God pledged to love us no matter what to be faithful to us, even despite our unfaithfulness back. Last week, the reading was about the covenant made through Abraham and Sarah, the promise to them that they would be the ancestors of, ancestors of a great nation and God would be the God of all those people, the people Israel. Again, unconditionally, not requiring anything in return from them. You could think of those first two covenants with Noah and with Abraham as covenants of a loving parent with a very small child. No matter what you do, I will always love you. But the Ten Commandments take our relationship into deeper waters. Now the covenant is being made with Israel through Moses, and our response is required. The commandments give the essence of the law, the Torah, setting forth the terms of the relationship between God and God's people. And now there are expectations for us. Now you could still, in a very broad way, read the Ten Commandments as a set of rules, mostly, of course, in reference to what not to do. There's only a few times of thou shalt and a lot of thou shalt not right? But when you look at them a little more closely, that interpretation breaks down. They're more statements of expectation than they are rules. And let's pause for an interesting bit of trivia on this, because if I was going to ask you, if I was going to come into your house and say, all right, recite the Ten Commandments for me, you might have a little trouble doing it, and not just because you're Episcopalian and don't know your Bible, but because there's 20 verses of this passage of Exodus that encompass the Ten Commandments, and exactly how those 20 verses break down into Ten Commandments is a little vague. Jews see it one way, Catholics and Lutherans interpret it another way, and all the rest of us see it still a third way. The first commandment might be I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, period. Or it might be that plus you shall have no other gods before me. The second commandment, number two, might be you shall not make for yourself an idol, but some people think that's part of the first commandment. And then when you skip to the end, the very last commandment might be the whole thing. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor, etc., etc. Or that might be actually two commandments. The second to last one being, you shall not cover your neighbor's house. And the second, or all the other stuff, right? 
So this set of commandments that we hold as so universal that we want to put them up in our courthouses, they're common to all of us, but maybe they're not quite as universally agreed upon as we thought. At any rate, you could break those commandments down into two main sets, if you like, if it feels good to categorize. The first being what we do as we relate to God, and the second being how we relate to one another. So if, as the Jews say, the first commandment is simply, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of slavery, well, that's not a commandment at all, is it? It's a statement from God about God's identity and history vis-a-vis -vis us. Like the earlier covenants with Noah and Abraham, there's nothing for us to do. It's simply, this is who God is. God is the one who has saved and cared for us. God is the one who brought us out of slavery, who frees us from bondage. God is the one who created everything that is. Full stop. But of course, having established that, if we're setting up the terms of a relationship here, then we have a response to make to that, and it should be obvious. Why on earth would we worship any other God or use God for our own purposes instead of what God intends? or fail to honor God with the way we structure our time and our labor. How we live shows whether we really believe who God is. Do we acknowledge who God is in this relationship or not? And as for how we treat one another, that second set of commandments, God is making this covenant with the whole people, the whole community of Israel, not a single individual. So it matters for that whole community to stay healthy and intact, which is why all those commandments have to do with the basics of maintaining a stable, safe society where people are not killing each other or cheating on one another or stealing we're not threatening one another with the desire for what you got and I don't have. And again, it should be obvious, if we live in community with one another and our health depends on the community being healthy, why would we want to mistreat one another? Because how you are affects me, right? And yet somehow, we don't always get that right. If you want a story that illustrates this, just look at the gospel scene. Jesus cleansing the temple. He wasn't there just having a meaningless temper tantrum, right? And he wasn't trying to tear down the whole system of temple worship either, no matter how Christians have sometimes misinterpreted that. Money changers, vendors of animals for sacrifice, that was part of the temple system. That work was part of how you went about preparing for a ritual like that of the Passover. But something was askew in the practice there. Some of those people were extorting money from the poor and setting up barriers in the relationship between God and the people. And that breaking of the covenant, that wrecking of the community of God's people, that was what was making Jesus angry. He wanted to realign people's relationship with God toward the actual relationship that it had been from the beginning, back to the covenants that God had made with Israel and with all of humanity. He was leading us away from those things that destroy relationship things that allow the oppression and exploitation of other people, things that prevent us from knowing God's love. That, in truth, was the whole sum and purpose of Jesus' life, to restore relationship for us all. 
which is not the same as evening up a score on a score sheet. So it's not just an idle question, maybe especially in Lent, how are you doing? Now, how would you answer if we could sit and talk about it? How is your relationship with God? Are you being faithful? Are you sustaining a truly monogamous relationship there? Or are there other gods getting a little more attention these days? Your investments, maybe, or your social activism, or your sourdough starter, your hunt for a vaccine appointment, whatever the thing is that's kind of preoccupying center stage in your mind. Does your time and your prayer life reflect your love for God? Or is your spirit and your calendar dominated by other things? What's the balance these days? And how is your relationship with other people? Does your relationship with others uphold and strengthen the good of all in the community? And by community, I mean the community of your family and friends, the community of the essential workers, the store employees, your coworkers, all those on whom your livelihood depends the community of all the people in this city, the community of all of humanity around the world. Are you in right relationship with all, in your consumer spending habits, in your care for others, in the way that you talk to and talk about others? Or is there something there that needs mending? In other words, the Ten Commandments are not just a lowest common denominator set of rules for us each to follow. Well, you know, it's only 10.30 and so far today I haven't killed anybody, so I'm doing okay. They're a holistic picture of what right relationship looks like with God and with our neighbor. As Jesus says, love God with all your heart. I can even love that person. <laughs> love God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength and your neighbor as yourself. And that really does sum it up. It's a pretty complete set of expectations. And it has implications for every bit of our lives, every day. Lent offers the opportunity again for a new start. And spring, too. It's spring cleaning time, right? Time for a little self-evaluation. Something like running a virus scan on the computer to put ourselves before God, to spread out all the pieces of our life on the table and sift through it there with Jesus, to see what looks shabby and in need of mending, what's gotten twisted and needs smoothing out, what is jumbled up and needs to be put into its proper order. Imagine God asking that question. How are you doing? How would you answer, honestly? How might we all answer? May God give us the courage to be truthful and to remember how deeply we are loved, always. Amen.
Friends, we are a part of a faith that goes back thousands of years and has lasted through good times and bad. And now we proclaim the strength of that faith in our church's statement of faith, the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate in the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son, is worshipped and glorified, as spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Hello, St. Michael's. My name is Lily Culver. I'm here to lead you in the prayers of the people. During the silences, you're welcome to add your own prayers by speaking them aloud, raising them to God in your heart, or typing them in the chat box or comment bar. When I say, Lord, meet us in the silence, please join me in responding, give us strength and hear our prayer. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for Michael, our presiding bishop, Andrew, Alan, and Mary, our bishops, for this gathering, for all ministers and people. We pray for our partner parish, Emmanuel Church in West Hampstead, London. We pray for those being ordained this coming weekend, especially Heather Skiss to the diaconate and Sister Marie Promise Atalon to the priesthood. Pray for the church. Lord, meet us in the silence. Give us strength and hear our prayer. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well being of all people. Give us the courage to bring to you our failures throughout time, known and unknown. Help us to speak your truth wherever and whenever your children are suffering. Pray for justice and peace. Lord, Meet us in the silence, give us strength and hear our prayer. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, those in prison and those who mourn. We pray for Shannon and family, the Schmidt family and the chaplains of White Plains Hospital, John and Lynn, Mark, Aaron, Rhea and Zephra, Anthony and family, Minnie, Cheryl, and Joey, Jerry, Paolo, Solai, Fallon and Quentin, Lionel and family, Daria, Ryan, Ken, Teresa, Alicia, and Carmen. Pray for those in any need or trouble. Lord, meet us in the silence, 
Give us strength and hear our prayer. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that all may find and be found by God. Lord, meet us in the silence. Give us strength and hear our prayer. I ask your prayers for the departed, remembering Noah, Job Henning, Audrey McKeever Hackett, and Chaplain Mary Beth Schmidt. Pray for those who have died. Lord, meet us in the silence, give us strength and hear our prayer. Praise God for those in every generation who have loved and followed the way of Jesus. Pray that we may have the grace to glorify Christ in all we do and say. Lord, meet us in the silence, give us strength, and hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Friends, may the peace of Christ be always with you. Also with you. Share the peace with one another, those around you, and those in the chat box or the comments bar. Peace. Hi, I'm Chantal Freeman. May the peace of the Lord be with you. Good morning. I'm Sam, peace be with you. I'm Stephanie Braxton, and peace be with you all. Hello, we are the St. Michael Zoom Sunday School. May the peace, the peace of the Lord be all always with you. At this time, it is customary to offer to God our first fruits, the best of what we have from our bounty. We bring our gifts to the altar to share, the bread and wine, as well as our monetary gifts, all of which we use to live as Christ's body in the world. So please continue to make your gift to St. Michael's. Information uh, for online giving is in the chat box. And now walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, right to give our thanks, thanks and praise. We praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time, you made ready the creation. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being, sun, moon, and stars, earth, winds, and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways, but we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so this day, we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing. and praise to you, holy and living God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and to reveal the riches of your grace, you looked with favor upon Mary, your willing servant, that she might conceive and bear a son, Jesus, the holy child of God. Living among us, Jesus loved us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick, and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself, yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to them and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you, gave it to them, and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now gathered at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ, crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your spirit over the whole earth. Make us your new creation the body of Christ given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with Mary the God-bearer, Michael the Archangel, Jude the Apostle, and all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, 
now and forever. Amen. And now, friends, gathered at the table of the Lord in body and in spirit, let us join together in our prayer for spiritual communion. Jesus, may all that is you flow into me. May your body and blood be my food and drink. May your passion and death be my strength and life. Jesus, with you by my side, enough has been given. May the shelter I seek be the shadow of your cross. Let me not run from the love which you offer, but hold me safe from the forces of evil. On each of my dyings, shed your light and your love. Keep calling to me until that day comes when with your saints I may praise you forever. Amen. Friends in Christ, the gifts of God for the people of God.
Friends, let us join together in our prayer after communion. Loving God, we give you thanks for restoring us in your image and nourishing us with spiritual food in the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. Now send us forth a people forgiven, healed, renewed, that we may proclaim your love to the world and continue in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. Again, uh, welcome and good morning to you all, especially if you're joining us for the first time. We're so glad you found your way to us, and we hope we can get to know you better. If you go to our website, stmichaelschurch.org, all spelled out, click on the I'm New tab. That will take you to a place where you can give us more info about you, and we can reach out and be in touch. And you can, among other things, um, sign up for our weekly email, which is full of information about things going on in our community. Um, today, at the end of our service, uh, we invite you to sign on again to a different Zoom link for our, first of all, a little coffee hour and conversation, then transitioning into the replay and then discussion of our Wednesday night Lenten series, which is on uh, repairing, recognizing and repairing um, racist damage, um, this process that we've been involved in at St. Michael's for some time now. If you are signed up for the Wednesday night series, we remind you to come. Wednesdays can come along without you realizing it's Wednesday. Um, but if you didn't make it, then you can always come and see the replay of the recording on Sundays and then have some discussion time with those who attend. So we invite you to do that today if you like. A couple of things coming up. One, for your prayers and your attendance online if you would like. This coming Saturday at our cathedral, Heather Sisk, who is being sponsored for ordination by St. Michael's Church, will be ordained to the transitional diaconate on her way to becoming a priest. And Sister Promise, who did her field education with us a few years back, is being ordained to the priesthood. And so if you'd like to support them, um, certainly pray for them, but you can also um, see in our, our weekly email the link for the service, which is this coming Saturday at 1030. In a little bit more time, the weekend after, that Saturday, the 20th, is our annual Lenten Quiet Day, this year led by our wonderful deacon, Elena, so uh, information on that also in the email. And then on Monday, the 22nd, right here in this church space, we'll be hosting a blood drive. So if you've been looking for ways to come back and be part of the building, here's a way to do that and do good for your community as well. So there's, again, information on that in the email. Monday, March 22nd, I believe it's from 11 to 5. And you may well have heard this, but there is a emergency blood shortage going on these days. So if you can give, consider coming and um, being part of that. There will even be some live music um, of some kind. We're still working on the details of that happening uh, during the day. So come and be part of that um, blood drive here. I think that's everything I'm supposed to tell you. Um, Again, it is a beautiful day, and the time is surely coming and not that far off when we will find a way to be back together in person. But until then, we are here together in this space. So blessings on the rest of your day today. Now we'll have our final prayer. Look mercifully on this, your family, almighty God, that by your great goodness, they may be governed and preserved evermore through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
bless the Lord.